let me just give a very brief summary what the Puka Vuchara voxel actually is. So we like to describe it as a localization platform, as an imaging platform where we can image DNA. A typical example would be a chromatin tracing experiment. We can image RNA. So a single molecule RNA screen would be an example. And most people use it to image protein. And so you can really image the whole central dogma. And I would assume most of you saw single molecule localization images before. Just here, a typical example, I just want to point out the main features of single molecule localization microscopy before we go more into the details. So what you see here are individual dots. So these are not noise in a normal confocal image. You would say, oh, that looks really noisy. No, here it's the information. It really indicates that each dot is the position of a single dye molecule. And that makes single molecule localization very quantitative because you actually uh, count dye molecules. And yes, it's super resolution microscopy. So here we show the typical range so that what you can image with single molecule localization microscopy, basically everything, every subcellular structure. So everything which is mitochondria down to viruses. That's the typical resolution um, range of a single molecule localization microscope. Super resolution is very popular for good reason. And just to put it into context, I like to use this poster from this excellent review uh, by the Galbrights. So what they did here, so in the background, you see a microtubule as you would see it in an electron microscope. So it's about 25 nanometer in diameter. If you look at, at it with a very good diffraction limited microscope, so let's say a high end confocal microscope, the structure gets blurred by about a factor of 10. So that's because of the diffraction limit. So the 25 nanometer microtubules appear in the microscope as being somewhere between 200 and 250 nanometer. That would be actually a very high end diffraction limited microscope. Now, of course, people always tried to push the resolution. And so that's where all the super resolution microscopes come into play. play. One very popular solution is structured illumination microscopy. Just as a reminder, that's this microscopy where you project patterns into the sample and this amplify lower frequencies. So with struct uh, structured illumination, you can typically double the resolution. So about 100 nanometer, if you add some deconvolution on top of it, people claim that you can get even a little bit better. Then we have this family of instruments like STAT, GSD. So these are point scanning microscopes. So you, you scan your sample, but then the trick that over your imaging laser, you overlay a depletion laser. So that is this famous donut, which suppresses uh, some of the fluorescences and shrinks the area where you get uh, fluorescence from. And these, so typical literature values for STAT and GSD are about 30 to 70 nanometer. And then we have the group of palm, storm, D storm, F palm, um, D storm. These are the methods we are talking about. So these are all summarized called as single molecule localization microscopy. And here, depending what literature you look, what are the conditions, you have a resolution between 10 and 55 nanometer. And one thing really take to keep in mind compared to other methods in this single molecule localization microscopy methods, resolution is limited by the number of photons you can collect. That's why we have this wide range here. So it's not limited by the wavelength as approximately in diffraction limited microscopy, but by the number of photons we collect. And we will come back to this uh, topic later in the presentation. Yeah, but now before I hand over to uh, Sam, 
Here's one of the reasons why you should go with a commercial system. Here, I really love this photo. Uh, it's the first palm system built by Harold Hess and Eric Betzig. They built it in their living room. That's how our system looks like. It's a small compact box. And now I will hand over to Sam and he will tell us what we find inside this box. Great, thank you Winfried. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you a bit about the technical side and some of the design considerations underlying the Vitara VXL microscope. Um, so the Vitara VXL is an optical benchtop microscope which has been optimized for single molecule localization. It utilizes our biplane detection methodology for apparently three-dimensional localizations even with a single objective Z position. Uh, we also provide a larger field of view uh, for OMLIX applications, up to five powerful laser lines for illumination, um, a flat illumination profile, and uh, an integrated multiplexing platform, uh, along with a workflow-oriented software to facilitate ease of use. Uh, I do want to start um, with a real-world setup of what this looks like in practice. Uh, so here you see the microscope itself with a very small footprint, um, and along with some of the peripheral items. So you have a laser module, uh, E-box stacked on top of that for electronics control, some chillers to run the system, uh, Flux uh, module for multiplexing, and our workstation. So the very small footprint of the instrument has been facilitated by using two vertical optical plates in the interior of the instrument to house the optical path. Um, this approach allows us to make a very compact uh, system it uh, also allows us to enhance the stability of the system by keeping all components indexed to a single metal plate, which in this case is the top plate of the instrument, uh, which also improves stability. The stability is further improved in several other ways. Um, one is we've shortened the beam path considerably from our previous generation, and we've also provided active temperature control and an autofocus module to help reduce Z-drift. The net result is Z-drifts on the order of 200 nanometers, typically, in uh, over multiple days of acquisition. So the next slide here is illustrating a schematic view of what the uh, optical path is inside the instrument. I'll start in the left-hand side here. We have our laser module with five, five different laser lines, which is fiber, fiber coupled to the microscope itself. We have a collimation of the fiber, uh, fiber coupling into the instrument, and that excitation is then relayed through an objective uh, through, me, through a dichroic to our high numerical aperture objective. We then also have our autofocus dichroic here to uh, allow the use of our autofocus module to maintain uh, accurate focus in the sample. Then on the emission side, we use a square aperture in the primary image plane, which is then relayed to the camera through our biplane module, which splits the image. This creates two images of the sample side by side on a single, on a single sensor. Uh, with slightly offset focal conditions. And the result is that one of these images is imaged from a slightly higher plane and one is imaged from a slightly lower plane. And this is what allows us to do three-dimensional localizations. Uh, and we'll come back to more about how that works in a few slides. Also on the right side, I'm showing our bypass uh, imaging mode where we have two mirrors that slide into place to bypass the biplane module and provide a larger field of view for protection. Now, as Winfried alluded to, uh, since single molecule localization fundamentally is a fitting routine to, to pixelated data rather than uh, image formation like a typical microscope, the ultimate resolution you can achieve is fundamentally determined by the number of photons that you can collect in this one over square root in relationship. And this uh, has several design implications for the instrument, which I'm going to go through in series. So, the first is that we have to select very powerful lasers for our instrument. Uh, we use five powerful laser lines to provide bright images and also facilitate fast imaging. 